Welcome to It Sports Fans, episode 22, the FTB TV podcast. Episode 22, 23rd of January in Cape Town, South Africa. Got an awesome episode coming up today. We're going to talk a little bit about was it Jose Mourinho's fault? Is it all Jose's fault? Is there anyone else who contributed? Who should the blame fall on for uh, Jose Mourinho's calamitous year and a half at Manchester United? And then secondly, we'll talk about the man at Tottenham, injured, Harry Kane. Is Harry Kane world class? I'll give you my thoughts on that. And then lastly, is Dale Steyn the greatest bowler of all time? I'll give you my thoughts on that. We're going to talk Kane, Steyn and Manchester United. Remember, we're on iTunes, Podbean, and YouTube. That is the FTB TV podcast. Otherwise, it is from the Bleachers TV on Facebook. FTB TV podcast on iTunes, Podbean, YouTube. Let's get underway. Thanks for joining me today. If you're listening to this, had a great day. So we're going to start off with somebody who's probably not having a great day. I saw a great interview this weekend with Jose Mourinho. And he was with Mr. Keys and old Andy at the B-In Studios. Jimmy Floyd Hasselblank Bank joined them. Very, very interesting and illuminating interview. A side we've never seen of the man of uh, Jose Mourinho. So I've seen a narrative. You know, I've been kind of watching the papers, reading the papers, listening to the pundits, listening to everybody around Man United. Of course, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, he's come in, the babyface assassin. And it is a feel-good honeymoon factor. But you have to ask yourself, when this narrative is being pushed this hard, is it all Jose's fault? Because the harder people have to push, then you need to investigate more. People are pushing back. You've always got to investigate more when people are pushing a narrative. Is it all Jose's fault? So let me put it to you this way, right? So you know these sickening couples on like on Facebook that everyone loves, you know, like you're happy for them and... We're happy for you. We love you as people. But you're a nightmare via social media. An absolute nightmare. And if you don't know the types I'm talking about, let me maybe clear that up for you. Like, they'd post something like, with a, with a selfie or whatever with them, you are my everything. The rock my life rests upon. Like, I love you. You know, they'd, be, they'd have comments like, I love you. No, I love you. No, I love you more. Like, you know the type of people I'm talking about. So you're getting an idea what I, what's going on here. And if you've thrown up, I understand. I completely understand because it is disgusting. If you're one of those people and you're listening to this, please understand it is horrendous. It is no good. If you got a bit sick in your mouth, I'll give you a second to go and clean yourself up. Listen, it's not because I'm a bachelor, right? I hope they're happy with Bay or whatever the kids are saying. But for goodness sake, really? Really, you love them more, huh? Anyway, look, don't you wish when these people broke up, the nightmare couple, like, if they're that honest with us and telling us that this person is their everything, don't you wish when they break up, they'd post something like, we broke up because your breath stinks. Or my mother hated you and she was right. Like, well, why don't they do that? Or like, we broke up because you had an affair with my boss. Put that, on, put that, on, put that up for us. Because I had to put up with your nonsense for however long. How come, how come I only ever hear the truth when things are going well? Why is there a filter when things are going badly? Like, why don't you tell me that your wife broke up with you because you had an affair with your boss? Tell me that. Because I had to put up with your selfies and I love you more stuff. Why is there a filter when things are going badly? And why, and here's the one, I, I've, I've actually had a real life experience. If I know you, do you not tell me how you contributed to YouTube breaking up? Because it always takes two to tango. So whenever people know you, it's always the other person. It's like, no, tell me your part as well. It takes two to tango. That's how I look at it. Listen, I lived this situation before. I lived it. I had a friend who got divorced. All right. She was the worst on social media. She was like the next level with her husband. It was terrible. Like I was, I was sad for her that she got divorced, but I was just happy for me 
because she's one of those people I don't want to delete on Facebook because I really love her. But I couldn't stand her posts anymore. And it, it, it was making me sick. Tragic, she got divorced. Fantastic for my social media. But anyway, listen. So it was one of those posting I love you more kind of situations. They got divorced after seven years. It was a whole thing. She ended up living with me for four months. Anyway, you know, she made this guy out to be like worse than pineapple on pizza. Like he, he was the devil personified. Okay. Anyway, look, after about a month, I'll be honest with you. I wanted to divorce my friend after she was living with me for a month. I wanted to get a divorce from her. She never cleaned up. She was always complaining. And she literally kept tarnishing the guy's character. Like, like if you've broken up with someone, get over it. Like, you don't have to keep telling me how bad they are. I'm your friend. We already know that it didn't work out. You don't have to tell me how bad the other person is. You broke up. Like, that's a clear sign. People have eyes. Or I do, anyway. Here's the part. I like the guy, right? I'd known her for longer, so I had to kind of choose her side for a bit. But, you know... You know how it goes. Like, I liked the guy. He was cool. He was awesome. Anyway, so I started hanging out with the guy. Because I got over this, my friend, living with her for four months. And it turns out, you know, as I'd already found out, she was the worst. She just was the worst. And, like, we're still friends, but I, I can see her in doses. She, I, I try to treat her like medicine. Just in small doses, I think too much of her will kill me. I treat her like a panado. So listen, the point being, after you break up, you know, wherever the noise generally comes from. And what I liked about the guy is he literally, him and I had a word and he, he said to me, he's never going to tarnish her in front of me because he knows we're friends. It's over and he's not going to tarnish her name. He said that he came to me and said that. But my point is this, you know, when people break up, wherever the noise is coming from, right? about the other person, wherever the most noise is coming from, generally that loud mouth was the problem. Wherever the most noise comes from, that loud mouth was the problem and probably generally the reason for the breakup. I find it incredible how somehow the media have convinced us that Jose had to go and he was the only problem. Like, it's unbelievable. Not a single Man United player has come out and said, we didn't step up. We weren't good enough. Not a single one. I've really, I've scoured the papers. I've looked for all the leaders that have been saying they're happier now and all of this nonsense that's coming out. The media has jumped on the bandwagon that Jose is outdated and had to go. So I thought, you know what? Let me look at the media because they're biased. They, they root for people. They root for news. They go for the simple story. I said, you know what? I wanted to look at the easy narratives that they generally feed us, right? They keep feeding us. And the old adage is what? Tell the lie enough times, it'll become the truth. The number one is he parked the bus, right? And he was too defensive wherever he was. So I decided to have a look and I said, how true is this? Okay, because men lie, women lie, numbers, they don't lie. It's the beauty of numbers. Men will tell a lie. Women will tell a lie. But numbers, they don't lie. So I went right, right back to his first serious job. Jose Mourinho's first serious job. That happened to be uh, Porto. So at Porto, <clears throat> Jose is uh, in 2002-2003. He had the second most goals in the league by one. Right? And people go, oh, it's Porto. But the previous season, Porto were eight goals shy of Sporting Lisbon. That's the season before Jose arrived. Sporting Lisbon had eight more goals than them. In that season, by the way, an incredible season. You need to go and look it up. Mario Jardel had 42 goals in 30 games. 2003-2004, Porto scored the most after selling their top goal scorer for six million to Tottenham. Helder Postiga went that way. Benny McCarthy came in. And the rest is glorious, glorious history. Then Jose Mourinho stepped up and announced himself as the special one. 2004-2005, Chelsea had the second most goals with a brand new team, remember. I mean, Chelsea brought in like six brand new players. And keep in mind, this was the season after Arsenal 
at their peak. The players were still at their peak. The Invincibles. He Not only did he dethrone the Invincibles, but Chelsea had the second most goals in the league with a brand new team. 2005-2006, Chelsea scored the most goals in the league. 2008-2009, he's at Inter Milan now. Inter Milan scored the most goals in Syria. 2009-2010, most goals in Syria. 2010-2011, now this is the greatest club era, pro, club team probably ever that he's facing now. Probably uh, you could give that AC Milan 90s team under Rigo Sacchi, maybe, maybe them. But I think it's, it's, it's widely accepted that the Barcelona team, when Leo Messi scored 91 goals in a calendar year in 2010-2011, Real Madrid came second in that year, in Mourinho's first year there, and scored the most goals in La Liga, with Messi getting 91 in the calendar year. In 2011-2012, most goals in La Liga. And so in Mourinho's last season at Madrid, not only did he get the most goals that season, it's the most anybody in the history of La Liga has ever scored. Let me let that sink in. It's the most anybody in La Liga has ever scored. Jose Mourinho. Previous season, most in La Liga. That was his first season. In his second season, they won the league, dethroned Pep Guardiola, and scored the most goals in La Liga history. Mourinho, of course, then came back to Chelsea. In his very first season back, he won the league, scored the second most goals in the league, and that was short-lived, but still the second most goals in the league. People go, yes, but it's Man United now. That's so long ago. I said, okay, let me have a look at the Man United numbers. Because that, that, that seems to be the problem, is that he didn't give Man United enough freedom. All right, let's look at Man United post-Fergie, because that's the correct way to do it. Let's look at all the managers. 2013-2014, Man United has the fifth most goals in the league. 2014-15, the fourth most goals. I'm not going to bother with who the managers are. So 13-14... The season after Fergie, fifth most goals in the league. 14 15, fourth most goals in the league. 2015 16, the tenth most goals in the league. Jose Mourinho arrives in 2016 2017. They go from tenth to seventh most goals in the league. 2017 18, they come second in the league. And the fifth goals in the fifth most goals in the league. So Jose took the tenth worst attack. Turned it into the seventh best attack, turned it into the fifth best attack. And remember, two years is all it took. They went from being the tenth best attack to the fifth best attack in two years and came second in the league. Now listen, you can you can read these numbers however you want. Most goals in Syria, most goals in Syria, most goals in La Liga, most goals in La Liga ever. Second most goals in the league uh, at Chelsea when he came back. Most goals at Chelsea in the league when he won it two, two on the spin, when he did the double. Most goals when he did the double treble at Porter. Read those numbers however you like, okay? If you don't like the numbers, I can't help you. All I know is that Jose is either parking the bus or he's not. Folks, you can't have it both ways. Jose Mourinho is either parking the bus or he's not. The numbers say he's not. I don't care how you feel. Just because you don't like him, it doesn't mean he's doing something wrong. Just because you don't like Jose Mourinho, it doesn't mean that he's doing something wrong. Either he's parking the bus or he's not. The second one is that Jose can only win with huge spending. Listen, this is quite a simple one. Besides Deco, I'm going to give you five seconds. Besides Deco, name one player from his Porto team which won the double treble. Name one player. That team went on to win the Champions League. And trust me, outside of Deco, you never really heard of anyone else. Paulo Ferreira, maybe Ricky Carvalho, if you know your football. Not a single player outside Really of Ricky Carvalho. And Deco didn't have the greatest career. Carvalho's may be the one. 
If you know those names, I'm very impressed. Add into a look, he spent £139 million pounds in two seasons with a very, very old team. That team needed replacing because you saw that as soon as he left, it all fell apart. Inter won the treble with a net spend of £70 million per season. Ronaldo in 2009 cost £80 million by himself. Plus, listen, he was, sell, he was forced to sell. Ibrahimovic was already on his way out when he came in. What did he get in, in, uh, sort of, in exchange? A really crocked Samuel Eto'o. Really crocked. Completely broken down. And ACL had changed the player Eto'o was. Turned him into a left winger. And the rest is treble history. Never done in Serie A before. Never been repeated. Listen, at Porto, he had a squad worth a glass of milk and half a biscuit, for goodness sake. Half a dry biscuit. And the milk was like half a glass of milk. So if it's not Jose parking the bus, and it's clearly not the spending, because he won another title at Chelsea in 2015, having spent nothing... What is the only thing that is the common denominator that isn't Jose Mourinho? The ball is still round. The rules haven't changed in 200 years. It's the players. We live in a time of instant gratification. I get it. It's the players. Man United players aren't good enough, but the media love the narrative. Because he is the pantomime villain. He is the self-anointed special one. The British don't li- don't really like that. Here's the thing, Man United. There aren't many great managers in world football. Man United caved to social pressure. I'd say it's 10% Jose's fault. Because I don't think he knew quite how poor Man United and how much Man United had eroded from the inside when he came in. I think he overestimated his own ability to turn around the Titanic. But the worst part is the board caved to social pressure. It's 10% Jose's fault. The other 90% is on Ed Woodward and the players. If you're a Manchester United fan, welcome to the life of an Arsenal fan. Welcome to the life of of a Liverpool fan. I guarantee you the single decision and this narrative of en- of entitling players as I spoke about yesterday, but definitely in this case, of blaming and hounding out the manager and succumbing to peer pressure. That is what Ed Woodward gets paid £5 million a year to avoid. He needs to make difficult decisions. Should have stuck with Jose because there aren't many great managers around the world and you just let the last one go, the greatest of his generation go. The next five years, Manchester United guaranteed disaster. I don't even need to I don't even need to watch it. Guaranteed disaster. Entitled players overpaid, a whole bunch of overpaid players, and nobody to keep them in check. You had the guy, you succumbed to peer pressure. This one's over. Stop the narrative. He's not parking the bus. It's got nothing to do with the spending. He's a great, great manager. And great is so rare in this world. Great is so, so rare in this world. It's one in a million stuff. Jose is just that. Men lie. Women lie. Numbers, they don't lie. Speaking of greatness, let me let me switch over to this one. Let's head over to Wembley because they, they, they play their home games in Wembley. I keep hearing this narrative of Harry Kane. Oh, it's, not, it's actually beyond a narrative now. It's almost like part of the Premier League and British society and the world football community has kind of accepted it, which is weird to me. Because if there's one term that I don't think should be used as much as it is in football or or at all is world class. I keep being told that Harry Kane is world class. I think it's because he's a nice guy and he's British and it's a feel good story. In a world where people are being paid 150 million to move. It's I, I think it's just a wonderful, just a feel good story. Listen, in the English language, when something is 
fantastic, right? And you know it is the, the sort of measurement for excellence. People call this the genuine article. If you haven't heard that term, go and Google it. The genuine, when something's the genuine article, it is the gold standard. It is the reference point without even needing to be checked. For example, if I say to you, Apple, Warren Buffett, Rolex, Marlon Brando, you immediately, with those names, you already know they're the best. I don't have to go and check. You go, you know that's going to be real. You don't have to check. You don't have to Google. You don't have to kind of think, um, Brando, would, would his movies be any good? What's The Godfather like? You've seen, you know who Marlon Brando is. You know who Warren Buffett is. Berkshire Hathaway. If you don't know who that is. Apple. I mean, their phones are everywhere. And Rolex, I mean, just because it ticks, it doesn't make it a Rolex. When I say to you, how was the restaurant last night? And your answer is, it was great, but my food was cold. I know you're not talking about the genuine article. If you ever have to validate something with but, it's no longer the genuine article. Daniel Day-Lewis, he doesn't do interviews, he doesn't do movie tours, he doesn't do any of this nonsense, hallabaloo that, that most of these guys have to do for his movies. Why? Why do you think that is? Why do you think Daniel Day-Lewis, you've never seen an interview with him? But you know when he's in your movie, it's Oscar time. He's three for three in his last biggest roles. If you haven't seen There Will Be Blood, I can't help you, it's probably the greatest performance you'll ever see cinematic performance of the 20th century why do you think daniel day lewis doesn't do interviews he doesn't do press tours he doesn't do any media hype he's not on instagram i'll tell you why albert einstein said it best the greater the knowledge the less the ego the lesser the knowledge the more the ego it's the greater, it's essentially the greater the ability, the less the ego. The less the ability, the more the ego. And what does ego do? It keeps making you tell people. Make, it puts on the outside show. When you're not quite it on the inside like Mike Tyson and you have to bite people's ears and you've got to do crazy stuff. When you're not the man, when you're not the real thing, you've got to keep telling people that you're the real thing. Right? The greater the ability, the less the ego. The less the ego, the greater the ability. Point here is if you or people have to keep telling me how great you are, you probably aren't great. I'm going to give you a few names from football's past and present, and I'll give you a second to answer. The question is is this person world class? And I'll just I'll say a few names. And see how long it takes you to, to say yes or no or whatever your feeling is. So I'll give you a second after I say each name. Philippe Lam. Andrei Shevchenko. Kaká. Pavel Nedved. Andrea Perlo. Luis Suarez. Sergio Aguero. Eden Hazard. Neymar. Tony Cruz. If you're honest, you didn't need to think about any of those for a millisecond. Like your mind said, yes, immediately. Lam, Shevchenko, Kaka, Pavel Nedved, Andrea Perlo, Luis Suarez, Sergio Aguero, Eden Hazard, Neymar, Cruz. I could have said it that quickly and you would have been saying yes for each one. If you're honest, your mind yells yes straight away. You don't have to think about it. You've got to think about Andrea Perlo. You've got to think about Tony Cruz. Now I say to you, Harry Kane. I'll give you a second to digest that one. What's your first thought? It's probably to go and Google how many goals has Harry Kane scored so far in his career, right? That's probably the first thing you're saying. Like, let me go build a case. And right there is why Harry Kane is not world class. He, and he's nowhere near it. There are, in reality, I've had a look at the list of today's players from the top uh, nine clubs in the world. 
there are in reality about 15 genuinely world-class players. I'll get on to what I think genuinely world-class is in another podcast. But there's about 15 players that are genuinely world-class. Because to be genuinely world-class, you can't just be the best as an individual. You have to make the team around you play better than their ability. That's what world-class people do. It's not just how good they are. Do they raise everyone's standard around them? You know, when people meet great people, they always tell you you can feel the aura coming off that person. I'm sure you've heard that when people say, oh, I was in the crowd near Nelson Mandela. You could feel the aura. People always said, whether they believe it or not, but just seeing somebody like that, they feel it. Part of being world class is the aura. And aura makes everyone who's in contact with you feel like they are bigger. You, you can be 5'11 and you'll feel 6'3 with the right people around you. That's part of being world class. The other part is that people actually on a deeper level, all football fans do, no matter how much they want to root for their team, people know it's a team game. And Harry Kane looks like he's it until you explore the numbers a little bit more. You see, if it's a case of Kane just being the best because of goals, then you have to, logically, what you have to be saying is the following. You have to be saying that Darren, Darren Bent, Peter Crouch, Romelu Lukaku, Emil Heskey, Dion Dublin, Ian Wright, Harry Kane, Dwight York, Nicholas Anelka, Robbie Keane, Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank, Robin Van Persie, Teddy Sheringham, Les Ferdinand, D- Michael Owen, Sergio Aguero, Jermaine Defoe, Robbie Fowler, Andy Cole, Wayne Rooney, and Alan Shearer are all better strikers than Didier Drogba. You have to be saying that. Because the only argument I ever hear with Harry Kane is look at his goals. And if that is that is the criteria for what world class is now, I've never known it to be that. Then all of those strikers have relegated Didier Drogba to being the 23rd best striker. You'll notice I left one name out there because Thierry Henry is out on his own. When I add Henry to that list, it's 22 people are better than Thierry Henry excuse me, than Didier Drogba. That's what you have to be saying if it's just a goals thing, right? If it's just a goals thing, Didier Drogba is officially the 23rd best striker the Premier League has ever seen. And if you believe that, you need to go and have yourself medically checked. Also, listen, it goes beyond that. It's like... Sport offers you moments to transcend the normal and head and and become world class and legendary. That's what sport is about. It's about moments. Do you capture those moments? Ricky Ponting, for instance, I was at the Wanderers when he made that incredible hundred in the World Cup final in two thousand and three. Nobody ever thought he could win without Alan Border and that and the previous great team of the nineties. What did Ponting do? He seized the moment. I'm the captain. I'm the guy at the Wanderers, and he blazed an incredible 100 in the World Cup final. That's seizing a moment. Ponting went from just another guy who was riding the gravy train to becoming a legendary captain after Steve Waugh. Excuse me, not Alan Border, Steve Waugh. Harry Kane had his moment. It came. He had his chance to inspire his team to the title in 2015-2016 with 10 games to go. Spurs got knocked out actually of Europa League with 9 games to go. But with 10 games to go in the league, there were no longer any excuses after 9 games. Because you were out of Europa now, it was just Premier League football. Anyway, with 10 games to go, Spurs are 3 points off Leicester. And what happened from there? Spurs finished third, 11 points behind Leicester. Harry Kane does score 9 and 10, though. And surely that goes against my argument then. I mean, the guy lifted his team. He did his part, surely. 9 and 10, come on. Can't ask for much better than that. I've always said it. Harry Kane is empty calories. He is empty calories. I'll tell you what happened. Two goals against eventually relegated Aston Villa. Two goals against... 
Fifth from bottom, Bournemouth. Two goals against Stoke. So that's six of the nine. Where's Harry against West Brom at home when they drew 1-1? West Brom at home. Drew 1-1. Nothing. Southampton, they lost to Southampton at home. Spurs lost to Southampton at home. Save us, Harry. Nothing. 5-1 lost to a 10-man Newcastle. And listen to this part. So Mitrovic gets sent off in the 67th minute. That leaves them 23 minutes of regulation and probably 5 minutes added on. So that's about half an hour at 3-1 down. At that stage, it was 3-1. They went on to lose 5-1 against 10 men. 67th minute Mitrovic was sent off. We need you, Harry. Lays an egg. So that's nine points right there. They went on to finish 11 points behind Leicester. That's nine points that I've just catalogued for you in the in the run-in. They had no more Europa to worry about. Dortmund dealt with them, spanked them 3-0, sent Tottenham out. So the last 10 games, they went from being three points behind to finishing 11 behind. But my goodness, Harry got nine and 10. Empty calories. See, here's the difference between world class. And what, what illuminates it for me is that the guy who left Tottenham, Right, You see, Gareth Bale went to Real Madrid and did something very interesting. Because the perception is, oh, come on, he's at Real Madrid. You know, when Ronaldo was injured in the Copa del Rey final, if you haven't Googled it or if you didn't see this goal, it, it, it may be the greatest athletic show you have ever seen on a football field. Gareth Bale actually runs off the pitch for about five meters. He runs around, uh, I think it's Batra. And he runs off the pitch and around the play. It is incredible athleticism. But in that moment, Gareth Bale sees the moment to go from just a, a very, very good player. And he said, I'm real. I'm world class. And what transpired after that was Bale was officially world class. And Real Madrid, remember, could not win the Champions League without Bale. They had Ronaldo. They had them all. When Bale arrived... Remember they won in La Decima. He scored two goals in the La Decima game. Gareth Bale in the three Champions League games has scored in two of the Champions League finals. And this last one was unbelievable. I don't know how it did win goal of the year. That's world class. When, when the moment comes, cometh the moment, cometh the hour, cometh the man. Harry Kane had his opportunity. Gareth Bale had his opportunity. One seized it. The other did not. And Bales, Bales had more opportunities to fail and has delivered. Copa del Rey, it is the stuff of legends. Three Champions League titles in a row when he arrived. Stop telling me about Kane's goals, for goodness sake. It means nothing. It's meaningless to me. Kevin Phillips got 30 in the league. What must I do with that? It's meaningless. What must I do with that? Kane had his chance in 2015, 2016 to shut people like me up. And settle this argument. Instead, he let Jamie Vardy show him up. And in Britain, they call it, he bottled it. He done bottled it. Vardy and Mares showed him up. They showed metal. And you can't say Kane was tired. I've already told you, in the last 10 games, they got knocked out with 9 games. To, sorry, they got knocked out with 9 games to go of Europa League. But in the last 10 games, they were 3 points behind. So they had nine games of nothing, of just league. They'd already been knocked out of the FA Cup. They'd already been there, so they got knocked out of Europa. So the last nine games, they have no excuses. Mares, Vardy showed Harry Kane up, and he bowled him. Listen, I wish Harry could prove me wrong. All right, I, I seriously, I, I do. I wish he he seems like a great guy. He seems. From all of the reports I've read, his teammates, everybody seems to think the world of him. I wish he'd, he'd prove me wrong, but he's injured now and Spurs, Spurs will probably finish third or fourth. What does that tell you? He doesn't lift the team. Without him, they'll finish without him. Listen to me. Roy Keane, Vidic, Henri, Lampard, Neuer. They lifted teams, not just their stats. Everybody feels huge around those dudes. Everybody feels two inches taller around those guys. 
because it's not just about your individual stats on a deep level. We all know it is a team sport. Don't give me empty calories. Kevin Phillips got 30 in the league. It's meaningless to me. What must I do with that? If you don't win, it is a team sport first. It's not Harry Kane United. It's Tottenham Hotspur. Harry Kane, very good player. Good player. Very good player. But world class, let me think about it. Let me think about it. Speaking of world class, I had a very cool experience this summer. I went to go watch Test Cricket in Cape Town and there was an awesome moment in that. But before I get to the the, the awesome moment, let me take you through something called, I'm going to play a fun game. So we're on to cricket now. We're going to play a little game. So I'm going to give you some stats. It's called a blind resume. So I'm not, I'm not going to tell you any names. I'm just going to give you some stats. Okay, so this one guy has played 131 tests. That's 131 tests. He's bowled 400 and, sorry, 4,623 overs. He's taken 434 wickets at an average of 29.64. His strike rate is 63.9. So that's about a wicket every 10 overs. You'd probably think, oh my goodness, that is sensational. And you're right. It is sensational. His name's Kapil Dev. Then I tell you, this guy, right, he's got 565 wickets. He's bowled 5,291 overs at an average of 26.98. And his strike rate is about 56.1, right? You'd say, wow, that's incredible. 145 tests of incredible. Five sixty five wickets in one hundred and forty five tests. That's James Anderson. Strike rate of fifty six point one. I'll do one more. Let me do one more. Okay. What about this one? One hundred and forty five matches. That's one hundred and forty five matches. He's bowled six thousand seven hundred eighty four overs, and he's taken seven hundred and eight wickets. At an average of 25.41. With a strike rate of 57.4. That's just that's a wicket every nine and a bit overs. Nine and a half overs or so. You go, okay, that's unmatchable, surely. 708 wickets. 145 matches. Strike rate of 57. That's unmatchable. He's got to be the best of all time. And you're right, he is the greatest of all time. The greatest leg spinner of all time. Talking about one Shane Keith Warren. So recently in Cape Town, I witnessed Dale Stan do something quite remarkable. And at the time, I didn't realize it because I was watching the cricket live. So I didn't realize it at the time that I was watching history and indeed watching one of the greatest to ever do this thing. It was incredible to, to see this man do his thing. It was quite remarkable. He passed Sean Pollock's mark with 18 less test matches on his resume. Dale Stain at that stage had played 18 less test matches than Sean Pollock. Pollock has bowled 1,013 more overs when Dale Stain passed him. 1,013 more overs. He's bowled 1,000 more overs less more than Dale Stain. Listen, Stain's numbers, obviously after this, I, I went and took a look at them. After investigation, they are scary. 433 wickets, 3,045 overs bowled, 22.81 average, and his strike rate, and this is the most incredible part, is 42.1. That's, that's a wicket every seven overs. That's a wicket every seven overs. If you don't play cricket, that's unheard of. 
let me give you some perspective because I've put out a lot of numbers here, right? To give you some perspective on what I'm talking about here. Stuart Broad, who is England's second greatest wicket taker, I think he is. Stuart Broad is also on 433 wickets. The only difference is that Stain has played 33 less test matches. Stuart Broad is on 433 wickets. The only difference is that Dale Stain has played less, 33 less test matches. I'm going to let that sink in. Listen, after all of this, you say, surely Stain is the greatest. I mean, he's got the greatest strike rate inside of uh, for anybody with th uh, more than 300 test wickets. Surely, this is the greatest bowler ever. I mean, if he was to bowl as many overs as Pollock, hypothetically, let's say with his current numbers and we project the current strike rate out at 42.1, he'd get 577 wickets in 108 matches, which is what Pollock played. So if he bowled another 1,013 overs with his current strike rate, he goes to 577. Let me tell you where that put him. He'd have 14 more wickets than Glenn McGraw in 16 less tests than Glenn McGraw. Let me just say that for you again. He'd have 14 more test wickets than Glenn the Pigeon McGraw in 16 less test matches. The GOAT, Stain, surely. Gotta be. Sadly, no. I try to torture all the numbers. And it pains me because I love Dale Stain and I love the Proteus. But it's actually a really simple one. Stain hasn't won the biggest prize in world cricket. It's eluded him. And if you don't know me, you'll get to know I don't take one day cricket seriously. So it's not the World Cup. The World Cup for me doesn't, no, no, nothing in clown suits, all of that. Those are clown suits that they're wearing. Colorful kits are for clowns, not real cricketers. One day cricket's a joke. All right, it is, as far as I'm concerned. The biggest prize in, test, in cricket has eluded Dale Stane. And McGrath unfortunately managed it. And probably when India were at their best. I don't think the current Indian team is as good as the one just before it. Late 90s, early noughties, Dravid, Tenduka, Azruddin, that team. McGraw managed to go to India and get a series victory. And it's not like Stain hasn't had his chances. And if anything, it was slightly easier for Stain because it wasn't a five-match series. You know, to beat India over five matches, which is what Australia did, that's another level. And McGrath and Gillespie were at the front of that, but McGrath in particular, I'll never forget watching that series live. And Stain's had two chances. He's been on two tours to India. And he did what he could on both occasions, but he came up short. And most recently, in a two-match series in 2009-2010, he came up short again. Listen, I wish I, I could say, because I love Dale Stain, and the numbers are incredible. The numbers tell you, surely... I wish I could say it doesn't matter, but winning matters. Winning team first. Can you carry your team? Can you deliver your team to the promised land? McGrath did it over and over and over again. He did it for 15 years. Warren was a part of that. I think Shane Warren's the greatest bowler to ever live. But Stain couldn't deliver in India. And that, you know, it's so close that you have to now start... You have to, it's got to be fine margins. And the fine margin I could find, and I tried not to look too hard, but McGrath went to India and spearheaded a victory in a five match series in India. That, that'll never happen again. Not with the way they doctor the pitches in the last, even then. For that Australian team, that tells you how great they were, and that tells you how great McGrath was at leading that bowling unit along with Gillespie. In this order, Warren, McGrath, Stain. That's my top three. It pains me because Stain's numbers are, nobody's even close. Waka Yunus with a 43 strike rate is the closest, but Waka's got almost 100 less wickets. I think he's on 377. Dale's on 433. Listen, I never, let's squash one thing. 
Like, I never want to hear this again. I never want to hear a single Englishman compare James Anderson to Stain again. I, I never want to hear that. I never want to hear who's the swing king. I never want to hear that nonsense. I don't ever want to hear an Englishman comparing Dale Stain and James Anderson like they're in the same... He they're not even in the same universe. They are not even in the same universe. Stop it. It's getting embarrassing for the English now. It's getting embarrassing. Stop. Stain is the Champions League and Anderson is in the Championship. That's the gulf. Congratulations to South Africa's greatest bowler ever. And in my opinion, no matter what he does from here, unless he can stay fit for next year's... Yes, end of year. We're going to India. Unless he can stay fit for that tour and somehow manage to spearhead the attack to win that India series. If Dale Stane does that... It's unanimous. If Dale Stane goes to India, manufactures a victory, remember now there's Pajara who's starting to become their drabid, Virat who's their guy. If he can go to India and you know they'll doctor those pitches and there will be a dust bowl. If Stane can go to India, lead the Proteas to a series victory, it's unanimous. But for now, I'd like to congratulate South Africa's greatest ever bowler. I don't think I don't think in our lifetime we'll see anybody catch him. To Dale Stan, congratulations. To the Polar Water Express, I say to you, big up, my brother. Warren McGrath. And in third place, Dale Stain. That is my all-time, all-time list. I'd love to hear everybody else's list. You can leave that in the comments section below. Looking forward to talking about this subject. I'm sure I'll have plenty of feedback. That is it for the FTB TV podcast from the Bleachers TV podcast. That was awesome. Man, oh man, that was awesome. That was such an awesome episode. Looking forward to tomorrow. We will do so much more. Friday 5 this weekend coming up. That's going to be awesome as well. Remember iTunes, Podbean. Please make sure to give us a rating on iTunes 5 star and give us some feedback. Otherwise, you can join us on Facebook. And on Facebook, it is from the Bleachers TV. From the Bleachers TV. Go and subscribe, like, and share. For now, until tomorrow, thank you very much.